Hello, everybody. Professor Nagy here. Uh, we are going to talk about geospatial technologies today. So getting a little bit broader in terms of all the different technologies that kind of make up the geospatial world. Uh, GIS is just one of them, uh, but it has a relationship to other geospatial technologies. And I think that's important to talk about kind of this world of geospatial. And so what is it? Geospatial. Uh, these technologies, geospatial technologies, is a term used to describe the range of modern tools contributing to the geographic mapping and analysis of the Earth and its phenomena. Um, we didn't always have this uh, suite of technology, and so we had just talked about uh, the history of GIS, so it feels like uh, uh, the history of GIS is kind of expanding in terms of the history and now in present day um, a lot more uh, pieces and parts to it that are coming together that you can use um, uh, kind of in concert with each other. You don't have to, uh, but again it's important to know what they are. And so the primary technologies are GPS, global positioning systems, remote sensing, which is uh, satellite imagery and a specific type of analysis for that type of data, and internet mapping technologies, also known as IMTs, those are kind of like your Google Maps, and then GIS. And so we'll talk about all those things today. So let's talk a little bit about GPS. Um, GPS is a US-owned utility that provides users with positioning, navigation, and timing, also known as PNT services. Um, and they're a combination of three different capabilities. And so let's talk about each of those. We have positioning, which is the ability to accurately and precisely determine one's location and orientation two-dimensionally or three-dimensionally when required. So again, thinking about um, this concept of space, uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional, uh, uh, the additional Z value, for example, when we were talking about the um, elevation, uh, depth, relief. Uh, Reference to a standard geodetic system, which now you're familiar with projections and coordinate systems. Um, uh, the standard geo geodetic system that we talk about a lot is the World Geodetic System, 1984, WGIS 84. Um, we've talked about that a little bit. Uh, navigation, the ability to determine current and desired position, whether it's relative or absolute. Absolute meaning, yep, yep, that's exactly right, or relative, well, that's pretty close. And apply corrections to course, orientation, and speed to attain a de desired position anywhere around the world, from subsurface to surface and from surface to space. So again, this concept of two-dimensional, three-dimensional, um, and the, this idea of uh, uh, taking that uh, flat two-dimensional plane and kind of the world and reality around us. And then timing, the ability to acquire and maintain accurate and precise time from a standard uh, uh, UTC. Uh, that is something that, um, you may actually see uh, within the options of um, state plane systems uh, when with respect to projection coordinate systems, but um, anywhere in the world and within user defined timeliness parameters. So you can, you can set some parameters around that. Um, timing also includes time transfer. Get, it's not necessarily uh, important to know all the specifics of these different pieces of the PNT services. It's, it's important to know positioning, navigation, and timing, but not necessarily the details within that because that gets into, again, outside of GIS. It is one of the geospatial technologies out there. Um, you could decide that this is something that you want to become more involved in is GPS. Um, and that is a little bit different from GIS. Um, again, it focuses more on positioning, navigation, and timing, uh, but you can use GPS data within a GIS. Um, it gets, uh, you are able to process and prepare uh, the data to be used in other platforms. <clears throat> and you know it very well uh, through the use of your smartphones, uh, how um, GPS is used to pinpoint where you are, where you're going, um, at how it follows you uh, across your route. So it's something that you use every day, and it's, I, I think it's, uh, we oftentimes take this for granted that there are people that are professionals doing this data prep and uh, translation for you, for me as a user of that uh, type of system. A little bit more about GPS. Um, GPS has its origins in the Sputnik era uh, when scientists were able to track the satellite with shifts in its radio signal known as the Doppler effect. And I have a couple links here so you can read more about it. Uh, this is the changes in frequency of any kind of sound or light wave produced by a moving source. Um, the US Navy 
again, this is a, a US um, utility, uh, remember GPS. The US Navy conducted satellite navigation experiments in the mid 60s to track US submarines carrying nuclear missiles. So that was kind of the onset of um, the use of this technology, again, you know, within our defense system, our military. Um, and with six sat satellites orbiting the poles, submarines were able to observe the satellite changes in Doppler and pinpoint the submarine's location within a matter of minutes. So um, again, this is around the time uh, kind of when GIS was just being conceived, uh, but it, a lot of the conception of well, what can we do with a system like this is based on existing data. Like uh, what is this new data and what can we do with it? How can we read it? How can we translate it? Um, and in the early 70s, the Department of Defense wanted to ensure a robust, stable satellite navigation system would be available to us. And so the DOD decided to use satellites to support their proposed navigation system. And then they followed through and launched its first navigation system with timing and ranging, known as NAVSTAR, um, in 1978. The 24 satellite system became fully operational in 93. Uh, so and kind of putting it in context of here we are in 2021, um, I mean, in, this is technology that's developing really fast um, at the time. And I expect that evolution uh, of data and systems that we'll have will keep evolving based on these different technologies that we um, are able to create. Um, GPS Today, um, it's a multi-use space-based radio navigation system owned by the U.S. government and operated by the U.S. Air Force to meet national defense, homeland security, civil, commercial, and scientific needs. Um, we use that data. Now it's, it's uh, available to us and it provides two levels of service. We have standard positioning service, SPS, and then precise positioning service, PPS. Um, you can see those different uh, types of service um, if you were to look up uh, uh, sourcing uh, related to your GPS um, information. Uh, but you see access to PPS is restricted to US Armed Forces um, and we're of uh, kind of internal use. Uh, but the SPS is available to all users on a continuous worldwide basis, free of any direct user charges. Um, those are explicit charges, meaning you're not getting a bill, but I have a feeling that we are paying for it somehow. The specific capabilities pro provided by SPS, um, the standard positioning service, are published in the Global Positioning System Performance Standards and Specifications. And I'll let you look at that at your leisure. Um, different um, different aspects of GPS, we've got um, different segments. And so we've got the space segment, the control segment, and the user segment. Let's talk about the space segment. And so the GPS space segment consists of a constellation of satellites transmitting radio signals to users. Um, they fly in medium Earth orbit at an altitude of approximately um, 12,500 miles. Um, each satellite circles the Earth twice a day. This constellation, this arrangement of satellites ensures that users can view at least four satellites from virtually any point on the planet. Um, and the US maintains the availability of at least 30 operational GPS satellites 95% of the time. So that's pretty good uptime, no, not a lot of downtime. Um, you know, think about the last time that GPS, your GPS was not available. Um, it's hard to, hard to say, but there are times, right? Um, it's kind of, are you, uh, well, one, do you even have service in a particular area, um, which can you read data if you don't have service um, in a mobile environment that we're on now? Clearly not. A little bit more about the control segment. Uh, so that consists of a global network of ground facilities um, that track the GPS satellites. Uh, they monitor tr transmissions, perform analyses, and send commands to commands and data to the constellation. So it's a, a back and forth really communication system between the ground facilities and the actual GPS, uh, uh, the satellites in orbit. The current operational control segment includes a master control station, an alternate master control station, and 11 command and control antennas, and six straight 16 monitoring sites. This is globally. Um, as part of the GPS modernization program, the Air Force has um, upgraded the GPS control segment for many years. And the ground upgrades are necessary to command and control the newer GPS satellites and to enhance cybersecurity. Cybersecurity being um, uh, something that, again, is becoming part, uh, but part of geospatial, uh, the geospatial world. Uh, because it's who do we want to access data, how sensitive is it, how private uh, should it be. Uh, and so cybersecurity is a concern. 
Move into the user segment. Uh, so the user segment includes the equipment of the military personnel and civilians who receive GPS signals. Um, we are included in that. We are civilians. Um, some of you may actually be, be military in this class. Um, military GPS user equipment has been integrated into all of its vehicles and equipment. Um, in addition to basic navigation, uh, military applications of GPS include target destination or target designation. Sorry, but I suppose that you need to know the destination um, of a target as well. Uh, close air support, smart weapons, uh, meaning a, um, a web enabled or internet uh, enabled system uh, within the weapon itself and rendezvous points. Because the GPS user does not need to communicate with the satellite, you know, we don't need to talk to the satellite. Um, GPS can serve an unlimited number of users. So again, it's kind of it's not a multi-directional um, uh, relationship between an end user as a civilian um, and the actual satellites themselves. Moving from GPS, now we're going to talk about remote sensing. You know, there is a relationship between the two, um, and it is because of the satellite imagery. So remote sensing um, is the process of detecting and monitoring the physical characteristics of an area by measuring its reflected and emitted radiation at a distance, typically from satellite or aircraft. So you see the connection to GPS here. Special cameras collect remotely sensed images, which help researchers sense, quote unquote, sense things about the Earth, thus remote sensing, sensing from afar. Remote sensing is the science of obtaining the physical properties of an area without actually being there. So again, the use of um, a, a proxy, the satellite. It allows users to capture, visualize, and analyze objects and features on Earth's surface. And by collecting imagery, we can classify it into different kinds of land cover. Um, let's see, I don't have a link there, but um, uh, a lot of um, remote sensing, uh, this, this idea of using remotely sensed data um, is valuable. Um, we don't offer a remote sensing course uh, but again, remote sensing is kind of its own little, it's its own beast. Um, and it's because it's a different science than GIS. Uh, but it's important to know about remote sensing uh, because it has a lot to do with data sources as well. You know, where are you getting uh, satellite imagery from? Um, how do you read it? Again, those are some of the specialties of remote sensing, which we won't do in this class. Uh, but know that um, we can use remotely sensed images, remotely sensed uh, capture, data capture in a GIS. And there is, uh, we have one exercise um, in the software where you'll be classifying uh, some remote sensing data. Anyway, sensors are attached to aerial vehicles. Uh, makes sense, right? Um, we have to collect it from somewhere and it's above. So airplanes, satellites, and unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, have specialized platforms that carry sensors to capture the imagery. Um, each type of vehicle platform has its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, when you want to capture imagery, you have to consider factors like flight restrictions, image resolution, and coverage. Um, flight restrictions, um, that's something that's actually, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later when it comes to geospatial uh, law and policy. Um, as the, the actual uh, uh, UAVs, are of more concern uh, than other types of um, technologies. Um, so can you fly a drone in a particular area, for example, if there are flight restrictions? Clearly not. Um, image resolution um, and coverage. Coverage meaning how big of an area are you capturing in this image? And then the resol resolution, um, how clear um, the image is uh, from how far it's being captured from. And so for example, satellites capture data at a global scale but drones are a better fit for flying small areas. So, and finally, airplanes and helicopters kind of take that middle ground. Um, so all of these different aerial vehicles um, can be used as part of the data capture process. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I'm not gonna get too technical in the types of sensors and all that kind of stuff, but it's important to know what kinds of, at least the basics, there are two types of sensors uh, that are associated with remote sensing instruments. Um, active and passive. And so active sensors provide their own source of energy to illuminate the objects they observe. An active sensor emits radiation in the direction of the target to, meet, to be investigated. And the sensor then detects and measures the radiation that is reflected or backscattered from the target. Um, passive sensors differently detect natural energy 
uh, that is emitted or reflected by the object or scene being observed. So active meaning you are providing uh, a variable here and that is illumination um, uh, uh, through uh, uh, radiation, the energy. Passive means it's coming from the source itself and you're not creating um, this variable of introducing um, a, a variable there. Um, on the other hand, that is emitted or reflected by the object seen being observed. Uh, reflected sunlight is the most common source of radiation measured, measured by passive sensors. Um, makes, makes sense, right? We're trying to uh, detect radiation. Um, we're uh, capturing this through um, uh, light uh, for the most part. Um, that's how we're uh, measuring the reflection, right? We need to have some source of light uh, to uh, be captured to help with the imagery. Um, a little bit more about the images. So remote sensing images are characterized by their spectral, spatial, radiometric, and temporal resolutions. Again, you can kind of see why this is its own area of uh, research and its own discipline. Um, we have uh, the four different kinds. Spectral resolution is the bandwidth and the sampling rate over which the sensor gathers information about the scene, um, the place that data is being captured for. Spatial resolution is the smallest features in the scene that can be separated. Um, oftentimes this is, if you were to visualize this, is kind of visualizing it in a grid pattern, um, what can be separated from another uh, in terms of the grid. The radiometric resolution is the dynamic range or the total number of discrete signals of strength that the sensor can record. And then the temporal resolution is the time elapsed between consecutive images of the same ground location taken by the sensor. Um, so um, think of um, you taking a picture with your phone and you accidentally press the um, keep your finger on the actual picture taking button and it captures you know 20 images of the same thing that are separated by seconds. That's, that's what this temporal resolution is. Um, Satellite-based sensors, um, based on their orbit, may dwell continuously on an area or revisit the same area every few days. And the temporal characteristic is helpful in monitoring land use changes. Um, you know, what's happening, um, what's happening in areas of vegetation, what's happening in areas that uh, may be um, flood prone uh, or uh, water is receding from a, a flood disaster of some sort. Um, also development, um, you're gonna get a different resolution for uh, an urbanized area that's covered with asphalt versus a natural area that doesn't have as much asphalt, concrete, um, you know, uh, pervious surfaces. Now, something a little bit more common, something a little bit more, um, more along the lines of GIS and something that we'll do in this class is work with internet mapping technology, um, something that you guys probably work with a lot, Google Maps. Um, I don't know if you actually work, quote unquote, work with it um, or if you just use it. So we will actually do some stuff um, in Google Maps um, as one of the activities when we get to the software portion of the class. The term web mapping constitutes both the technology and the art of sharing maps on the internet. IMTs are those web platforms which make them available. Uh, the simplest internet-based maps are static, such as images like JPEGs or TIFFs, and you're not allowed to change the components, extent, or appearance of the map really. Um, that means uh, that when you go into Google Maps, you see that base map and you can't change it. Um, you can't modify uh, the shape of a building or you can't modify uh, the, uh, where the road goes. It is a static image. These maps are the easiest and simplest to share because all that is required is placing the image on a web server and telling others where to find it, just like Google Maps. At the opposite end of the spectrum are customizable interactive web-based maps. Um, you will do some web-based uh, map analysis, um, but it is vector-based. But again, we'll talk about file formats later on. These maps are usually created with the use of modern hardware and complex software. And these require human expertise for successful implementation, meaning it's not just grabbing an image and saying, here, here it is. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, customizing those and making them interactive so you can make changes, analyze, um, and make more meaning out of the data that you have access to. A um, couple of the platforms, again, I've mentioned Google Maps like a million times. I'm going to mention it again, um, particularly because the underlying file formats associated with the features in Google Maps um, are vector data. Um, and something that a GIS uses. It's also becoming uh, the file types, uh, the, 
the names of the files, the types of files uh, that are used for spatial data um, are also becoming a little bit more standardized. Uh, so at one point, and we'll talk about, again, we'll talk about files uh, in another session, but um, Google Map files are now um, just as easily to import and export out of a GIS um, as the original proprietary GIS software um, uh, file format of Shapefile. So Google Maps, just by their sheer use, um, and then creating or, or making available some interactive elements in Google Maps, like you can create your own Google Map with your own stuff on it, which is what we're going to do. Um, but it's, it's the best online mapping program. Um, it's rich in information. The data provided are more up to date with good dri driving directions. Uh, sometimes accuracy of data can be somewhat misleading since anyone can edit the map and submit the information. Again, it's a public platform. It's an open source platform. Um, so whenever we have people managing things, I mean, same with computers. Um, if, if you see something that's this doesn't seem right, you know, you're right to question it. Like, is that accurate? Is that up to date? Um, who was the author of that? Um, just like Wikipedia. Um, the other IMT platform that's widely used is OpenStreetMap. Um, QGIS also works with OpenStreetMap um, as well as Google Maps. So know that uh, we'll be bringing some of that data in or that data um, platform is built in to QGIS and other GIS softwares. OpenStreetMap is also crowdsourced. It's built by a community of mappers that contribute and maintain data about roads, trails, cafes, all sorts of stuff. Um, the project aims squarely at creating and providing free geographic data, such as street maps, to anyone who wants them. Again, it's a free editable map of the whole world. Um, crowdsourced. Um, next, a little bit differently from the flat map, um, we had digital globes. Um, again, they're, uh, they're really cool to look at and to use as ways of, you know, looking at, um, looking at a place. But many digital globes, you can't do a lot of custom stuff with. It's more of you capture that particular image um, and you can use it for your purposes. Um, a digital globe generates an environment in which the user is provided with an immersive experience in Earth imagery, not only in 2D, but also in 3D. Um, we're not going to use any digital globes in this class, but again, I just want to make these available. You've probably heard of um, Google Earth. Um, you know, it's the you know, next step past uh, Google Maps. Um, Google Earth is a free download for the basic one. Um, I encourage you to download it and take a look and have some fun with it. Um, yeah, you can do some customizable stuff in, in Google Earth, but again, it's not a GIS. Um, it is a type of internet mapping platform, but it's in 3D. So it's an internet, uh, I don't want to say internet mapping platform, but you know, it's a um, digital sphere. Uh, and so it has that dimension to it. A um, couple other platforms that you can use for digital globes are Microsoft Virtual Earth, um, also known as Bing, um, or owned uh, in partnership with Bing. We have Cesium, and then NAS NASA's WorldWind. Uh, again, Google Earth and Microsoft Virtual Earth are probably the more well-known, but a couple other ones if you want to just check them out um, and use them as well. Some you actually have to download, um, and others you use a web platform to access. So internet mapping or GIS, you know, what's the difference? Um, why can't I do one thing with one? Why can't I do um, all of my GIS work in a internet mapping platform? Well, you can to a certain extent. Um, the thing is you can't analyze um, using the mathematical tools that are built into the GIS. Um, you also can't do some of the processing uh, that you can do in a GIS, but you can do some simple things. And so, um, Many of the questions that students ask is like, well, why do I need to know GIS? And it's kind of like, well, we introduce you to internet mapping and we introduce you to GIS. And you're going to find that some things are easier to do in an internet mapping technology. Say you're, you're uh, writing a report or doing some research in which you're referencing a particular area. That doesn't require analysis. That's literally a data capture from um, Google Maps. You take the image, you put it into your report, you may be able to draw some things in your um, Google map. You know, maybe you want to circle something. Maybe you want to put a couple points in there to highlight landmarks or important corners. You can do those things, but that doesn't really require analysis. It's more of creating a map product, which is important in its own right, but it's different from GIS. And so internet mapping technologies 
Uh, software programs like Google Earth and web features like Microsoft Virtual Earth are changing the way geospatial data is viewed and shared. I think it's great. That's democratizing data, making this available for, for anybody, for the public. Um, again, with the caveat of, do you have access to the internet? The developments in user interface are also making such technologies available to a wider audience, whereas traditional GIS has been reserved for specialists and those who invest time in learning complex software programs. So again, democratizing uh, uh, geospatial analysis, democratizing um, access. There's still gonna be a need for GIS specialists. There's still gonna be, need, be a need for remote sensing specialists. Um, all of those things will continue to exist. Um, I just think that the methods will change a little bit. The technology will change a little bit and the methods will change a little bit. But in terms of um, things not being available to the public, I don't see that changing. Uh, and so as we uh, learn how to do things um, that are more seamless, uh, more efficient, they become available to the public. And this idea of user interface, like um, we'll talk some software stuff in another session, but you know, user interface, how you operate um, a software program or an application, which buttons do you click? Um, why can't I do this over here, but I can do this over here? Um, the, that's user interface. Um, and as user interface becomes easier, like you don't have to click so many buttons to do something, um, then it becomes more widespread um, in being used by the public. I wanted to talk a little bit about geospatial policy. I mean, we are in a, the number two policy uh, college in the country. Uh, and so it's important to mention policy within the uh, context of geospatial technologies and data. Spatial policies, spatial rules, spatial regulations have come about in an unplanned manner. Um, and it's because the technology is moving faster than our ability to legislate it. Um, either as a political response to a heated debate or in reaction to security concerns, you know, that's, that's an unplanned manner. Um, there are lawsuits related to data or geospatial technologies um, shape, to policy, shape the policies at the federal level. So honestly, we don't have a lot of policies in place um, to start because it, we kind of waited for somebody to use it in a, in, a, in a bad way. And so it was, or people to prevent use of it, uh, which is in a bad way. And that leads to lawsuits. And then it's like, oh, you know, we have a lawsuit about the use of this particular data application, but we don't even have any policies around it. So um, again, this idea of uh, more of a reactionary uh, stance to rules and regulations around geospatial technology and data. But for any policy implementation to be effective, it must work in tandem with a formal spatial law and regulatory framework. <clears throat> so a little bit more about geospatial law. Um, kind of it's broken into a couple different uh, buckets here. Um, so geospatial technologies have a location component, which is often critical to privacy and security. Remember my earlier mention of cybersecurity, um, privacy being something that's really important. Um, however, with the emergence of new technologies and um, uh, more widespread use and availability of big data and analytics, um, the applications have become diverse and seamless. And so this calls for a mechanism of policy implementation to ensure gainful use while safeguarding safety, ethics, and security. Um, again, a lot of it is reactionary, but it, it is an emerging area of law um, that deals exclusively with spatial technology and its applications. Um, it's part of a government's policymaking process for regulation of lawful, ethical, and bona fide use of spatial technologies and practice areas. Um, spatial law would thus include legislation con concerning the collection, visualization, distribution, and use of spatial data using various geospatial technologies or other technologies with a location component. Um, so it's these laws um, are being drafted um, and legislated um, specifically related to collection, visualiza visualization, distribution, and use of spatial data. So there's the geospatial applications and then the actual technologies, right? The things that we use to view it or uh, uh, manipulate it. Spatial law also includes accountability, taxation, and contractual obligations in spatial data capture, kind of satellite imagery, where are we getting it from? Usage and distribution. Um, this would govern acquisition, acquisition and ownership rights of data used, licensing of geospatial technologies like UAVs, um, unmanned aerial vehicles for commercial gain, sharing of data in various practice areas like uh, leveraging location intelligence, um, and also penalties for noncompliance of regulatory policies in place. 
So just like all of our other rules and regulations and policies, um, we didn't have one um, until something started to go awry. And so as geospatial world grows, um, I think we're going to see a lot more um, a lot more legislation around appropriate use, distribution, collection of geospatial data and technologies. Um, more about those the, those two buckets. So we have geospatial technologies and then geospatial apps applications. The geospatial applications governed by spatial law, um, application scenarios and data. And so um, application scenarios include purpose of data capture and data capture, data usage and data sharing. Um, <clears throat> different is the actual geospatial technologies. So technologies are the devices, the things that are collecting the data and the applications are how are we using this data. So geospatial technologies governed by spatial law include remote sensing um, and the imagery that's produced from that. Um, uh, the, uh, again, not, not the imagery itself, but rather the equipment um, um, and uh, vehicles that are used to capture it. Um, UAVs, drones, and um, quadcopter, um, that's just an example. Um, GPS, other location technology, um, web mapping services, um, and cloud GIS. So again, those are technologies that um, uh, how we view, use, uh, manipulate uh, uh, the data um, uh, that's related to the capture of it. Like what devices are we using to do this stuff with geospatial data? And then the other side of it is, okay, we have this data. Um, why did we get it? Uh, uh, how did we get it? Um, how are we going to use it and how are we gonna share it? So. Geospatial technologies and applications. This is a midterm question, so I just want to put a little room there. Um, remote sensing and satellite imagery, again, kind of in the context of um, privacy. So, imagery is a core element of any country's national defense, homeland security, intelligence operations, and foreign policy. Uh, most countries have a remote sensing policy in place that adopts a, a, a robust approach towards the needs of critical intelligence. Um, I have here the US's comprehensive legal and policy framework that administers remote sensing and commercial uh, imagery. Um, administers means, are you following the rules? Um, most nations do not have formal laws, but rather overall national policies. Um, so that's kind of like a, a mission statement of um, here's, here's, here's what you should know uh, before doing geospatial stuff. Um, but it, there are no formal laws. It's more of here's what's supposed to happen. And so when we think about the um, onset of uh, lawsuits uh, related to the use of um, geospatial data and technologies, again, we have lawsuits, but we didn't have a law in the first place. And so it's reactionary. Again, most nations don't have these formal laws, so it's going to be reactionary when a lawsuit comes about. Um, the objective is to protect access to data in high security zones and regulate distribution of commercial imagery. That's kind of the purpose behind it. But, you know, politics is politics, so there may be other reasons too. Um, UAVs and UASs um, are the most controversial. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, most being the UAV, um, applications are no longer confined to military operations and disaster response. So you can have these unmanned aerial vehicles, and a lot of it is um, when you get in trouble for using those things, um, it's because um, civilians are using them um, in places where there are there are regulations for uh, devices like that in the air. And so in the US, at the FAA has been developing regulations for UAVs in the civilian space. Um, it's interesting, so you have a high level federal agency developing regulations. Um, they are monitoring safety issues, uh, but they do not look into the safe and ethical usage of drones or recreational use. So they're not passing judgment on that. They're more of here's where you can use it and here's where you can't. So law and policy must develop to allow for societal and security controls. Um, issues of who can use the UAV, what data or images can be collected or how the information is shared need to be addressed and regulated. So they're working on it, quote unquote. Um, I have a link here, Unmanned Aerial, Aerial Vehicle Systems Association um, is the professional association working on these issues on behalf or in partnership with the FAA, uh, but there is currently no up-to-date national policy on UAVs. Um, I suspect that will change. 
um, or there's one kind of being drafted now. Um, in the United States, we have the Geolocation Privacy and Surveillance Act. A link that, oh, yep, that is a link uh, that you can go to and take a look at. Um, it was introduced in 2011. It aims to limit government surveillance using geolocation information. The Olympic probably watching, right? Um, but it's okay in certain cases, but not in others. So that's the crux of it, right? That's the crux of privacy. The legal framework was extended to give commercial entities and private citizens clear guidelines for when and how geolocation information can be accessed and used. So we have an act um, and we have somebody to um, a federal agency to enforce those things. Um, however, with the widespread use of location-based devices, regulation of location-based technologies have become equivocal. Um, so God, you know, uh, what, what's the new um, uh, vehicle uh, or device that's out there, out there capturing things? It's kind of like, well, pff, new technologies are be being developed every day. So it's hard to keep track of all of them um, until we catalog um, and uh, provide criteria around what counts. Um, location information must be permission-based by law. Uh, and so the uh, installation of the location-based service application comes together with the user opt-in for allowing device location. So this is related to your smartphones, um, your other devices, um, it's permission-based. So you have the option to opt out. I don't know if you've ever tried that. Um, GIS data standards, um, you know, who is, we have to have some standard for, you know, can this data be used together? Uh, um, what are its limitations? And so we have to have some sort of data standard in place. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we have the National Spatial Data Infrastructure, NSDI. It was envisioned as a way of enhancing the accessibility, communication, and use of geospatial data to support a wide variety of decisions at all levels of society. Um, the goals of the NSDI, this uh, National Spatial Data, spatial data Infrastructure, um, are to reduce redundancy in geospatial data creation and maintenance. Because again, if you've got the same copies of the same data, that's taking up space somewhere. Um, space is money, just like time is money. Um, they also want to reduce the cost of geospatial data creation and maintenance and improve access to geospatial data, improve the accuracy of geospatial data used by the broader community. So again, um, all, all um, practical and realistic goals, um, again, putting some sort of uh, framework, comprehensive framework around spatial data. Um, and you can take a look at the executive order here as well. We also have the Federal Geographic Data Committee. Um, it's an organized structure of federal geospatial professionals and constituents that provide executive managerial and advisory direction and oversight for geospatial decisions and initiatives across the federal government. So you may, you may aspire to be um, one of those geospatial professionals that's part of this um, uh, federal oversight um, and enforcement of standards. Um, the FGDC engages in ongoing strategic planning to ensure continued investment of resources and high value programs, activities, and technologies for the advancement of um, geographic data. Um, more recently, we've got the Geospatial Data Act of 2018. Um, it became law um, a couple years ago. Um, it codifies the committee's processes and tools to develop, drive, and manage the national spatial, spatial data infrastructure. So again, when you have a act or a law, you have to have an agency um, that's associated with it. Um, the um, Geospatial Data Act reflects growing recognition of the essential role of geospatial data and technology in understanding and managing our world and highlights the need to support their continuing development as critical investments for the nation. So this kind of puts it up there as, hey, we recognize that this geospatial stuff um, is really valuable for us. It's, uh, it's valuable and helpful for um, civilians. Um, it's critical for our military. Uh, and so um, we get it, we understand. And so we're going to uh, make sure that we've got the, um, the infrastructure in place to uh, keep that a, um, an important priority for us um, in the country. And it reduces dupl duplicative efforts and facilitates the efficient procurement of geospatial expertise, technology, services, and data from the rapidly growing geographic community in the United States, like us. Now we have to talk about ethics. Um, ethics should be talked about everywhere in all classes, but um, special, special to mention here, 
the pace at which technological developments are taking place is beyond anything that we have ever experienced before. I, I anticipate it will continue at this rate in this way. Um, no one single person or group of people can stay on top of these developments and have a normal day job. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. Again, I think I've said I, I don't know every single thing there is to know about G, the GIS software, um, but I know the big ticket things and I know that things are developing every day as a result of technology. Um, and so always be humble uh, and say, gosh, you know, I didn't know about that thing or how do I stay on top of this stuff? I've suggested some professional associations to you to keep on top of things. Um, but almost everyone is a consumer or a producer of geospatial information in one way or another. So consumer being we use it or producer meaning, um, you know, the, uh, the points um, you know, where we are um, is recorded as a point somewhere. Um, so we are geospatial information if we're being tracked by GPS. Um, only a handful know anything about what you're learning in this class. Most of the public are geospatially misinformed, if informed at all, or if they even care. Um, there's a significant and growing gap between those with zero understanding about these topics and a small group of experts that know a lot. Um, we lack cohorts of advanced beginners who can articulate basic but important ideas, but you can change that. We are part of that cohort. Um, there is little coordination among the stakeholders in these domains, including multiple levels of government, industry, institutions, and academia. So why is the lack of coordination problematic for ethical matters? The absence of standards and consistencies and the presence of gaps and oversights are ripe breeding ground for mistakes. Um, or bad behavior. So not only is it difficult to remain current on the range of technology developments, but it's just as hard to maintain a well-rounded understanding of any subsequent or affiliated ethical implications. So again, um, uh, I point out the uh, discussion earlier uh, in which our geospatial law um, is reactionary right now, or our position on that, because a lot of the legislation hasn't happened yet because we have we didn't know it was a problem. Um, formal geospatial curricula, meaning the classes, what you what you learn, whether from a degree or some type of professional development, is more likely to focus on technology training than the values, choices, or responsibilities of their use, um, which I think is is a shame. Um, you know, and and I so here it is, um, kind of highlighting ethical factors in GIS and some of the questions that you can ask yourselves, um, just like. Any other professional association, we have a code of ethics and conduct on um, GIS professionals. And so the GIS CI, again, the GIS Certificate uh, Certification Institute, um, the one uh, is the organization that offers the um, GISP, GIS Professional Licensure. They have a code of ethics and conduct. Um, ERISA, uh, the other uh, you know, highly used, highly rated, well-known um, GIS organization has its own code of ethics. They're very similar. Um, and you'll find that there are some similarities with GIS ethics, um, like uh, your professional ethics. So we just being a professional, uh, being uh, one of high integrity and character, we have to recognize kind of where we fall uh, in, in society. Um, meaning what's my role um, as a GIS professional, um, not just uh, to myself, not just to my employer, but for the greater good. Um, this is some pretty important information. Um, and if you're gonna be analyzing it, um, you know, having, making sure that you are being transparent, making sure that you are questioning questionable uses for things, um, also flawed logic or flawed analysis. So we have obligations, um, obligations to society, obligations to employers and funders, people that are paying for our research or projects, um, obligations to colleagues and the profession, um, and obligations to individuals in society, so the public. Um, I encourage you, um, I strongly encourage you to review the GIS Code of Ethics and Conduct. Um, again, the GISCI and ERISA's code of um, ethics and conduct are very similar. Um, ERISA doesn't have, they don't offer any licensure. Um, however, they are a professional organization and so they have their own mission statement. Um, so I think it's important to point out that as um, emerging um, geospatial, at least technicians, 
um, after this class um, to be responsible, uh, to do the right thing. Um, sometimes it's hard to know what the right thing is, but when you are in doubt, you have a code of ethics and conduct um, to fall back on. And, and that's one of the things I, I tell the students in all my classes, that if you don't know what the quote unquote right thing is, who do you consult? What do you consult? Um, you know, and, and in line with professional guidance, um, we have codes, codes to follow um, and these obligations to others. So again, I think you kind of heard the, uh, the sincerity of my tone here in ethics and conduct uh, that not only is it important in life, um, it's important in your profession, um, and whether it's GIS or otherwise, we are governed by a code of ethics and conduct, uh, just like other professional uh, guidelines and frameworks. So take a look at this, spend a little bit of time. It's not terribly difficult and it's not too wordy, but I think it's helpful. And I think that might be the last slide. It is. So um, hopefully you enjoyed today's talk. Um, I have some assignments for you like usual. Um, I'm sad that I can't see you guys and can't be in a classroom with you, but um, maybe we'll figure out something where we can get together and talk on a, a Zoom call or something. I'll send out a survey and see if you guys want to just see each other or something. Anyway, hope you're doing well. Take care of yourself and I'll talk to you next time.